Okay, I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, development of a new manure amendment for reducing ammonium volatilization and phosphorus runoff from, from poultry litter. Uh, as most everyone here knows, phosphorus is generally the limiting nutrient uh, for eutrophication, at least in, in freshwater systems. And the majority of phosphorus runoff from, from pastures and no-till agriculture is soluble reactive phosphorus, and that's the form that's most available for, for algal uptake. Back in the 90s, we found that you could add aluminum, calcium, or iron compounds to manure and precipitate that or lower the solubility of that phosphorus. And we hypothesized that by doing that, you would decrease phosphorus runoff. And so we did some rainfall simulation studies with small plots and found when we added uh, alum or aluminum sulfate to poultry litter, we could reduce phosphorus runoff by as much as 87%. Uh, well, we also found that uh, it, it had other benefits. It reduced uh, uh, estrogen runoff by about 40% and it reduced heavy metal runoff, uh, arsenic, copper, and zinc levels were 40 to 50 percent lower. And, and you can see the difference in color. Uh, we had a real high rate of alum on the study. Also, we're applying the chicken litter at a fairly high rate. But uh, this is the real runoff water. And that difference in color is due to carbon compounds, humic and fulvic acids. And so some of that difference, those especially arsenic, copper, and zinc, are bound up with those humic and fulvic acids. So you know, with alum, you're flocculating those things out so you don't get as much carbon uh, runoff as well. Uh, we also found aluminum was not effective. We've, we've done a 20-year study on aluminum, and, and aluminum uptake by plants is not affected, and, and availability in the soil is, uh, is not affected. Well, in, in our first runoff study uh, by Shreve et al., we found tall fescue yields were significantly higher with alum-treated litter than normal litter. And we analyzed the plants and they had more nitrogen in them and there had been more nitrogen uptake. So we knew the nitrogen cycle had been affected some way. And we, we thought it was probably due to a, a decrease in ammonia volatilization. And I'm a soil scientist, so I went to the poultry guys and said, would it be a good thing to reduce ammonia in, uh, in these chicken houses? And you know, they just laughed and said, yeah, uh, ammonia, uh, negatively impacts the uh, weight gains, feed conversion, uh, egg production, and high ammonia increases susceptibility uh, to different diseases. And you know, when it gets really high in chicken houses, it can cause blindness. And I've seen several hundred birds in a house get blinded from, from high ammonia, ammonia levels. Well, what leaves those houses, the atmospheric ammonia contamination, can lead to uh, different environmental problems such as PM10s, uh, ammonia reacts with NOx and SOx <coughs> compounds and makes ammonium nitrate and ammonium sulfate particles. They're really small and if you inhale those that can cause uh, damage to the respiratory tract. And uh, also uh, excessive nitrogen loading into the aquatic environment. In some areas where you have lots of animals and lots of ammonia emissions, it probably dwarfs the amount of nitrogen entering lakes and rivers compared to, to runoff. Uh, and finally, soil acidification. <coughs> that ammonia that leaves finally gets into the soil, and when that it gets in there, it's nitrified. Well, nitrification is an acid-forming uh, reaction. You get two moles of acidity formed for every mole of ammonia. Back in the 1980s, the, the National Forest started dying in Holland and they blamed it on acid rain. Well, they started taking measurements and almost half of the acidity, 45% of the acidity, was due to ammonia. And most of that ammonia, 85% of that, was coming from, from uh, animal manure. Well, obviously there are several problems associated with ammonia. So we did some uh, uh, simple lab studies back in the 90s and, and we, uh, to see if uh, alum would reduce ammonia volatilization, and we found it did a good job doing that. Uh, and as far as the, it, we also found it was very cost effective. And then later we did a big EPA 319 study where we went to a couple of poultry farms and we would put alum in half of the houses and the other houses would be uh, controls. And we found a 70% reduction in ammonia emissions and the birds did better. There was better uh, poultry uh, performance. And so 
uh, what, what happens is you just spread the uh, alum, either a liquid or a solid, uh, on the litter between the flocks, and it's an acid, and so you're just shifting that ammonia ammonium equilibria towards ammonium, and so you're going to have less volatilization. You're also lowering that litter pH, and so you're going to reduce some of your pathogens in the litter. And finally, that aluminum is reacting with phosphorus to make an insoluble aluminum phosphate mineral, and uh, that's going to reduce phosphorus leaching and reduce uh, phosphorus runoff. Now, when we did those uh, studies in commercial houses, we found that uh, alum additions resulted in heavier birds, there was better uh, feed conversion, and lower condemnation, and that's probably due to the combination of having less ammonia in the air and fewer, uh, fewer pathogens. We also found in the wintertime the ventilation requirements in broiler houses were reduced because they didn't have to ventilate all the time to get rid of that high ammonia. And so they didn't have to burn as much propane. And so the, the uh, energy use was significantly reduced, the electricity too, uh, due to ventilation. And just recently, we just finished doing this, we, for a year we measured greenhouse gas emissions from a control house and an alum treated house and methane and nitrous oxide were not affected. But it was interesting, the carbon dioxide was, uh, emissions were significantly lower from alum treated houses. And, and we got to looking at the data and it was in the winter when that happened. And that's because they're burning less propane in, that, in those houses because they don't have to, to ventilate as much. So that's kind of neat. Uh, and another benefit with alum, you get higher nitrogen in the litter, as I said before, so you get significantly higher yields. And so these, these benefits uh, made it, uh, alum use cost effective we patented this back in 97, and General Chemical sells a product called All Clear. And during the past decade, it's really been uh, popular. Uh, right now, about a billion chickens a year are grown in the U.S. with, with alum. NRCS has developed a conservation practice standard for amendments like alum, so there's a quip cost share for that. And likewise, there's a lot of uh, poultry companies that provide cost share for alum use to the, to the uh, folks who use alum. Well, there's about 9 billion chickens grown in the U.S., and yet only 1 billion are grown with alum. So the question is, if it's so great, it has so many benefits and everything, how come more people aren't, aren't using it? And, and the answer is, is pretty simple. It's money. Uh, Alum has gotten very expensive in the last 20 years. When I first started doing this research, it was $200 a ton. And now, uh, the other day, we bought some in 50 pound bags and it would translate to about $600 a ton. It's gotten very expensive. Uh, and there's not always cost sharing from NRCS or an integrator. And a lot of those economic benefits, such as improving the feed conversion, really go back to the integrator. Uh, it, it helps the integrator a lot more than the grower. Well, when we did the original alum work, we tried to find a waste product. We looked all over the country at all different kinds of waste products, but we couldn't find any that would reduce that water-soluble phosphorus and reduce ammonia volatilization. Being from Arkansas, we went to Bauxite, Arkansas, where there was old alcohol aluminum plants, and we looked at red mud and brown mud. And those are waste streams from aluminum mining from the Bayer process. But the problem is they use sodium hydroxide on that process, and so those waste streams have a very high pH. And so when you mix those with manure, you actually increase volatilization, if anything. And then that's a very efficient extraction process. There's very little aluminum in that red and brown mud, relatively speaking. And so the, the soluble phosphorus wasn't reduced. Uh, and we looked at all kinds of other stuff. We, we found a ferric chloride one time from uh, the steel industry that worked great. It reduced uh, soluble phosphorus as good as alum or better. It reduced ammonia volatilization really well. And we thought, this is it. And then we eye capped the stuff. It had 24,000 parts per million chromium. It was just loaded with, uh, and you, you don't want to cause another problem trying to solve a problem. And so that's why we, we ended up sticking with alum. Well, come to find out there's another method that's used to make alum, and it's actually pretty common. And the second method, bauxite is ground up, and then it's react, reacted with sulfuric acid in a big reactor, and they stir it and stir it, and then they let the solids <coughs> settle out. And the stuff that's left over on top is basically liquid alum. And so they pull that off, and they either sell it as liquid alum, or they dry it to make dry alum. 
Well, the solids that settle out are called alum mud. And in the past, it's some, uh, they just threw it out the back 40. You know, and there's places where these old alum plants were. There's like 15 or 20 acres of alum. Of course, that's not allowed anymore. They have to landfill it. And it cost about $30 a wet ton to landfill this stuff, which is really expensive. Well, alum mud is acidic because they've reacted it with sulfuric acid already. But it's not acidic enough alone to be a good litter amount. So you're going to have to add more acid. Well, when you add more acid to that stuff, it becomes a wet, sticky mess. It's kind of like buckshot clay, if you're used to that. When it, when it gets wet, it just sticks to everything. And so uh, it it's not, doesn't have good handling characteristics. So what we did was a series of experiments where we made different mixtures of the chemicals that are available at these plants. Uh, alum mud, bauxite, sulfuric acid, liquid alum, and water, and tried to find a, a good amendment. And, and here's, here's some of our different uh, uh, mixtures. This is the alum mud, bauxite, sulfuric, liquid water. And, and these were just little, little quick and dirty studies that we did. And, when you mix these things up, when you, when you have bauxite and alum mud and you pour concentrated sulfuric acid on there, it's a pretty exothermic reaction. It heats up and you get a lot of uh, sometimes fumes and it'll bubble up and everything. But all, just about all of them within four or five minutes would be starting, they would just harden. And some of them would get really hard. Uh, I got going with my technician, I did the first couple three and then I said do all the rest of these and then tomorrow let's grind them in a mortar and pestle and sieve them through a 20 minute sieve and run all the uh, chemistries on them. And he said, okay. And then he came and got me the next day and he said, I want you to show me how to grind this one with a uh, mortar and pestle. And, and it was harder than granite. I mean, you couldn't break it with a hammer. It's kind of interesting though. We're going to try to patent that as a, a, a new replacement for concrete because it's a waste material that's very cheap and uh, it, it'll set underwater, set up underwater and, and it's not affected by acids. In a lot of environments, concrete is affected by acidity. Uh, but then other mixtures resulted in, uh, a, again, a wet, sticky mess, which you couldn't really process or handle. But we found there, there's a Goldilocks zone there. If you have just a little bit of bauxite, 5 to 15% bauxite, and then you mix that with the right amount of alumina, which is about 45 to 60%, and then you treat it with the right amount of sulfuric, 35 to 60 percent, and all this is on a weight basis, then it'll go through this reaction, and when it dries out, that sulfuric will take out the water, uh, and I'm not really sure how that works, but it'll take out the water, and you get this nice dry product that you can crumble up with your hand that uh, can be handled <coughs> out and spread in chicken houses. And so we compared these uh, best mixtures to uh, alum, dry and liquid alum, in uh, a lab study. Basically, we took 100 grams of fresh litter, we put it in 44 containers, we had 11 treatments. Treatments were surface applied without mixing. We went with 4 grams per 100 uh, grams of litter. That's roughly equivalent to 100 pounds of product per 1,000 square foot. That's kind of low for a lot of stuff I do, but it's typical of what the industry uses. We passed ammonia-free air through these containers and trapped in engulfed ammonia and boric acid traps. And then after two weeks, we analyzed for PHEC metals, uh, extractable phosphorus, and KCL extractable uh, ammonia. And again, these are some of our treatments. We had a control, four grams of dry alum, eight grams of liquid alum, it's about 50% alum by weight, and then all these different uh, mixtures. And this is just our setup. Uh, going on to some of the results. This is cumulative ammonia loss uh, as a function of time for two weeks. This is our control. We have about 3,000 milligrams of nitrogen per kilogram. Uh, our LSD was 442. There was no significant differences between dry alum, liquid alum, and these best three amendments. Uh, dry alum tended to work a little bit better than liquid alum, but again, no significant differences. And this is kind of amazing because uh, these products here, you could make for about one third the, the price it takes to make alum. Uh, so it, and, and they did just as good on ammonia volatilization. And here are some of the other amendments. Again, uh, not quite as good as those other ones, but a good significant reduction in ammonia volatilization compared to uh, 
compared to the untreated control. Uh, here I've got liver pH, cumulative ammonia loss, KCL extractable ammonia, water extractable pea, and water extractable zinc. And uh, for our controls and all these different treatments, you can see we've got a reduction in pH with all these different mixtures. Uh, I've already talked about the cumulative ammonia loss. Again, dry worked a little bit better than alum. I've been saying that for about 10 years because the, the people who sell it have gone on this big push to, for liquids, and I've been telling them dry works better, and we found that again here. The interesting thing, we found that the liquid actually uh, works better than the dry, at least in the short term, on reducing water extractable phosphorus. Uh, and a lot of these uh, different mixtures we found work better than dry alum on reducing water extractable phosphorus. They, they were actually significantly better. We also got reductions in, in uh, metal solubility, as we've seen before. I just showed zinc, but you could look at copper or arsenic. And uh, KCL, extractable ammonium, was increased, and that makes sense. You're going to have more inorganic ammonium in the litter if you're not losing it by uh, ammonium loss. So some of the conclusions, all of these manure amendments resulted in significantly lower ammonia volatilization than the control. Ammonia volatilization rates were reduced 60 to 70 percent with eight new manure amendments, which were not significantly different from, from uh, liquid alum. Three weren't different from dry alum. All amendments uh, reduced water extractable phosphorus. Three had lower water extractable phosphorus <coughs> than dry alum. Uh, the most promising products were just simple mixtures of alumud, uh, bauxite, and sulfuric acid. Uh, and, and, and so the potential impact of this is kind of enormous. I mean, because you can make this stuff really cheap. You're taking a waste product and you're making it to worth something. I mean, this is what this conference is about. And, and it, it's work, it works just as good as alum does in reducing phosphorus and reducing ammonia. So we're fixing to do some feeding trials uh, where we'll lace the diets or broilers with this stuff. Uh, we had to do that with alum before we went in commercial uh, broiler houses. One of the big integrators in Northwest Arkansas said we don't want any stinking aluminum in our chicken breast. And so uh, we're going to feed this uh, alum mud amendment and make sure, you know, there's no accumulation in the, in the breast. Because chickens, they eat the litter that they're standing on. And so you got to do this kind of thing. Uh, after that, we're going to do some pen trials where we'll put manure in there and we'll treat with alum, uh, some of it, dry alum, liquid alum, and then these new uh, uh, alum mud amendments. And we'll look at bird performance, ammonia volatilization, soluble phosphorus. We'll also do some rainfall simulations with the litter to make sure we're reducing phosphorus runoff and everything. If all those goes good, if, if there's no problems and so far we haven't seen them, then we will go to the commercial chicken houses with this new product and, uh, and see if it works. Thank you very much. One quick question while I switch. Yes, sir. I'm just curious about, um, you know, on a, <coughs> on a mole basis of aluminum, are, are, you know, is there a similar amount of aluminum in each of the products or? That's a good question. In the fact, efficiency of these per mole of aluminum, about the same? It, it's, it's interesting that uh, alum is about 10% aluminum and this alum mud is about 10% aluminum. So it's very, very similar to out. There's another question in the back. It, what is the content or the makeup of the off gas of the alum when you put it on the liver? Because uh, you know, when you go in the house after you put the, the uh, all through down, it's just like a, a cloud. So I was just always uh, interested in what, what it is. And that's the dry alum. That's just the dust. That's small dust particles. No. It's uh, gas. Well, I don't mean to say no, but it's, it's a gas when it reacts to I, I've never gas. seen a gas form. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I'm a grower and I use the product. It's really good. What you're okay. saying is right on, right on the note, but there's a lot of uh, off gas in that 12 hour window after you put it in and things start to heat up. It really, uh, that Trish, would you know what that is? Are you probably using a 7 air Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's the sulfuric acid reacting from ammonia to create a. Basically, 